Hey there, Poopal, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis, and today we're just going to scat a little bit about lore dumps and, and world building, um, because you don't want your lore to be number two in your player's mind, and we don't want to poo-poo your creativity, because lore that you create and do, do it well, and avoid dumps at all costs. So we're going to go ahead and get off the pot and talk about world building without the lore dump here on WebDM. This week's episode is sponsored by Hero Forge, masters of customizable miniatures. If you've never played with their online character creator, you are missing out. They've got so many options, including color printed plastic. You can make your character exactly the way you want it, and they come out looking great. They've got a new Hero Forge Pro Plus subscription service, which gives you five STL VTT credits and a free pre made pack every month. Or they can cast them for you and send them to your door. And if you've got a 3D printer, you can download the SDLs to print yourself. Go to HeroForge.com and start building your minis now. Link in the comments and description. All right, Jim. Mm. Let's let's uh, let's give a long and lavish uh, explanation as to what we're talking about today. With no, I'm kidding. Let's talk about how to world build without a lore dump, which yeah. is something that, that I mean. I know that I get questions about this all the time. It's something that I work on as a DM, how right. to like snare your players without giving them a tome to yeah. to freshen up on before they start yeah. so they know where they are in the world. Yeah, I do. um, don't give your players But what, what does this mean to you? What is What does world building without the lore dump mean to you? I, I mean, it, it literally means that you take all those details that, uh, you know, you would otherwise put in, in your history of and, and, and gazetteer style survey of your campaign world and and then you know share with the players in the hopes that they read it and get super into it and and like maybe they do maybe they don't there's a lot of different ways to do that but really though that that those sorts of documents and those sorts of ideas that dms generate about their world like they have value they can really enrich the campaign world and mm -hmm. like i think the popular conception that like players don't care they're not interested or you got to use generic vanilla like you know in, in its most watered down form of, of fantasy to like get people on the same page is like well I, I i just disagree i think there's ways of presenting lore about the world that it make it more inviting for the players and give them a reason to care and that's essentially to like embed as much of your game world's history and, and lore and past in the generic parts of the rule system you're using uh, in this case today dungeons the dragons so yeah well it is like 85 percent of the market share so let's get talking <laughs> here um so obviously one of the first places that you could do this uh, -huh. uh is with what every pc interfaces with their yeah. class their class yeah uh it's it's the e absolute easiest way uh, uh so uh so kick us off here uh, uh what do you think of here what what's your first what's your first take do you wait for them to uh make their classes and you and you and you fit the lore to it or do you go ahead and create the lore and just go ahead and assign certain things to certain classes so that when they come to you mm -hmm. you have it ready what's your usual kind of way to go at i mean like i i use a, a, a a lot of different uh, ways of approaching this. You know, if, if I have factions that I'm anticipating the, uh, you know, the, the party to interact with, then I will identify certain classes that are iconic to that faction. Like not everyone in the faction is going to be these classes, but you'll more often than not, the NPCs you meet will conform to one of these archetypes. And at this point, I'm thinking purely conceptually. Like I'm not actually mm -hmm. building character classes for for all these NPCs, uh, potentially. It's it's mostly there for headspace uh, and, and conceptual reasons. So I'll identify that uh, to any players who seem interested uh, in those factions. Um, but a, a lot of what I'll do is I will wait for the uh, you know the players to sort of signal which classes they're interested in, and then <clears throat> usually just as the beginning stages of a campaign go, I'll, I'll already have an idea of how the, each of the classes specifically fit into the campaign world. And so mm -hmm. I can then start filling in the details with the player so that, for example, if they say like, well, I'm thinking about being a bard and we go, okay, well, what kind of bard are you going to be? Like, we're literally talking about what college did you come from, right? Like yeah. all of the classes in fifth edition have this 
built in in some way, even like Rogue and Fighter, which use generic archetype uh, for theirs. There's the suggestion of an organization or a social institution behind these classes. And so yeah. I start thinking of things like, OK, if you're a barbarian, when it says path of the blank, that means something in the game world. That's the part of the class that people in the game world can go, oh, yeah, we don't know anything about barbarian or hit dice or whatever, but we know that totem warriors fight with the power of animals, right? Like that's what they mm -hmm. know. And so that's where the, the setting meets the mechanics for me in terms of class and just sort of hash out as, as much as the players would want um, what that looks like and how it uh, uh you know it, it it fits into their conception of their character as well like it's where you make the two two halves meet uh as it were oh yeah definitely and i mean like the, the obvious ones to me at least are the the thieves guild with the thieves and mm -hmm. for me like uh, wizards with their colleges bards with their colleges clerics you know, this is where you can really dive deep into, you know, what your religion looks like in your world. Right. If you have a cleric yeah. in the party, you know, how polytheistic is it? Or is it just a bunch of monotheisms living next door to one another? Right. Uh, so you right. can just have that inner turmoil of the church. But also, like, like who taught all those maneuvers to battle masters? Like, what right. war college yeah. did you go to to learn this? You know, yeah, uh, yeah. What fight, what's what their fight version of the art of war? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and sort of like in some ways you're looking at the classes through the, you know, like the fictional characters point of view. You're, you're you know, mm -hmm. it's like I'm, I go back and forth on like how much about the class as a mechanical thing is expressed in a game world. But like one of the things you can do because there is overlap is like the, the all fighters from this region are connected to this famous fighter. And that's all you have to say at character creation. You just let them know that there's a connection. You don't have to, this is about no lore dumps, right? You are letting them know yeah. that there's connection, that there's something that matters and that they might be interested in it and potentially have a, a hand in like forming the details of it and then letting, uh, letting them engage uh, from there. Um, and instead of just like reading something that's not connected, the connection to their character class can be a, a, a way to like invite that kind of engagement uh, with the lore of the world. Um, but like, even just, well, I gotta just think, we, this will be, we'll have to cut this transition out, but like, uh, <laughs> the next step would be creating custom subclasses, right? Like, oh yeah, that would be the big one. That's essentially what like Purple Dragon Knight, Blades, Blade Singer, those are, you know, Faerunian specific uh, subclasses, and it could be something really interesting to to explore with your uh, with your players if they are into it and. You want to create something that like really speaks to your world creating a custom subclass is like the best place to introduce lore about the world uh to your players and have them you know easier for them to engage with mm -hmm. oh yeah most definitely um and we're not going to give you a big lore dump about patreon we're just going to give you this invitation that if you go over there and follow us you can get a heck of a lot more lore from webdm so engage at your own risk with that um so <laughs> moving on from classes uh obviously the next part of like character creation is picking your background what i look at in terms of fifth edition is that the backgrounds and this is by this i mean like acolyte charlatan etc like they have a lot of implied blanks like places where you could go in and get really specific like what are the who are the people these bonds are referring to there's a lot of the the uh, uh the you know sort of tables about you know their ideals and their bonds and flaws that feature things that could easily be drivers of an early campaign of like i have an object that another group wants it's considered sacred or holy or valuable or whatever or i possess knowledge that you know other people don't have and and is dangerous like what is that? Like, how is it? How are those things tied to the setting? Like, in what way can we use those to like propel the opening adventures and like make this make the make the conflict that kicks off the campaign so much a part about the lore of the world because it's also tied to the characters and where they come from and what they did before they started adventuring. Um, 
like it's worth it to go in and, and get real specific about those uh, details you know if that's the kind of game you want uh, i mean i think that that the backgrounds were one of the kind of like oh wow uh, that's freaking cool uh, yeah, yeah. parts of D of fifth edition when we first cracked the book open right because mm-hmm. um, it really like it, it it really did kind of remind me of uh, 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 like cipher system like mm-hmm. uh, a mm-hmm. little bit uh, in that regard and just kind of a little extra wrinkle uh, yeah. and so the thing is though is that wrinkle could be really big like <laughs> when you talk up when you start getting into especially when you get into the ones like guild like guild member or yeah. art or guild artisan like noble. you are you are yeah, yeah or no i mean noble shit man if, if right. you have a noble in the party and really play that up uh yeah. here's an example in a different game but the way we're playing it in our in a samurai game that i'm playing uh-huh. we have like a princess that is being you know looked at looked for because her father was killed and they're trying to erase his line but mm-hmm. we have a freaking noble going around with us having to hide and like like all the things that come with that. But when we go to a place that we need to talk to the local Lord, well, guess what that noble is front and center with all the etiquette and everything that is, that is, uh, uh given, uh, uh, her station. Right. So that we can get, go through doors that would otherwise be shut. Like yeah. really playing up the nobility or, or again, like you could, that could, that could dovetail into either like monasteries for monks, like with fear mm-hmm. an acolyte or, um uh, or something like that or a sage did you go to the right right place can you get into the right libraries like really like taking those little nuggets that they give you in background and and slapping a name on that library and being like yeah you can only get into this library but guess what it's the biggest one in the world right yeah where is this place what does this look like who what what like all the ones that suggest a, a an, an institution or a, a social network or something that that is behind this class feature or, or in this case background feature or whatever like fleshing that out and making it it's it is as real and as impactful in your game as you make it and uh one way to make it impactful is to tie it to the lore of your game world and you know give these places just enough history so that you could just say, give them a snippet just a little just a little bit this is what this is. Oh yeah, this library was influential in this, or or it, you know, there's a, a school of thought there that, you know, is dominant across these these parts of the land, and this is sort of the the heart of that, uh, you know, academic movement or whatever. This is the guild that is, you know, doing cutting edge, innovative things with their craft, you know, and, and making, you know, trying a new way of building or creating or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me, and like have that you know is, is that something the player is interested in then you can roll with it and if not you haven't done you haven't given a huge lore dump <laughs> that then is like the information that nobody uh wanted or or asked for is going to use so yeah yeah most definitely um uh be, because you know building the proper campaign requires the uh the right tools so uh equipment is another another piece of that puzzle uh, and you might just think, oh, it's just swords and armor and whatever. But like mm-hmm. how, like how the, how the armor and swords are made, what material are they made from? Like sure. these can be big cultural indicators. Like mithril is a big thing for dwarves, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so expanding on that, like what, what different uh, areas have access to uh, can, can really start uh, kind of changing how the game starts, uh, especially yeah. like starting equipment. Are you in a right. place where things are a little bit uh, better off? So maybe you have a little bit better starting equipment than you normally would just because you're from this area mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. they, they've kind of like codified this thing a little bit better and they know that start, Oh, you just graduated from the college. Well, you're going to need this, this, and this, you know, here's your care right. package. You go out in the world, <laughs> right. <laughs> As provided by your university. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's the, I mean, can I think starting uh, with like just changing the way the sample starting gear uh, is, you know, what's included, what it, you know, what it is, all the choices that they get to make where it's like, oh, a martial weapon or two simple weapons or whatever. And then just saying like, you know what, in the interest of, of, of 
creating a living, breathing world and, and tying this place to uh, to the lore, like, these, this is limited. They just don't have crossbows here. Or nobody really fights with a sword here, right? It's not the culturally dominant weapon, uh, and so they don't really make them. Um, or if they do, it's this one kind of sword. It's not just any of them. And you do that with a lot. Like, you know, what does it mean that, the, you know, that these people use this type of weapon versus this other? Or to move beyond the weapons table, like all the gear that they may or may not have and, and you know whether or not it's appropriate for a character of this um you know background to to have access to like an alchemist supplies kit you know but not just that not just like access and availability but but making everything like less generic part of the you know part of the equipment table uh, in fifth edition is that it's really just kind of a generic thing and and if anything, there's a lot of redundancy in it uh, that, that uh, you know, if they went truly generic, <laughs> they could get rid of. But, like, a quick search on the internet will tell you, like, all different kinds of synonyms for weapons that you can just call a hand axe and a short sword and can send a, a strong, like, indicator of the the culture that they come from uh, that produces them, the, the, the look and feel of a particular place or people. Uh, and, and it could really go a long way uh, towards, um, you know, establishing a, a world. Uh, it, it, you know, if you're willing to put in the work, it, it does take a little bit of work, but I think it's worth it. Oh, definitely. And I think another one that uh, uh, it, it was a nice little it's a nice little table in the book and I love rolling on it. But the but you're starting trinket. Oh, like, yeah. Really yeah. trying to tie your starting trinket into a bit of lore. Like, and, and for the DM to work with your players, like it's only one little thing on each of their character sheets. Yeah. yeah. But like you were, uh, you said something earlier about like, you have a thing that is a religious symbol of someone else. Like right. why couldn't one, somebody starting trinket, like, yeah, it's just a rock my dad found and he handed it down to me. He died under mysterious circumstances. It's because he's been chased by a cult of like true believers. And he took literally their like arc stone or whatever you want to call it, you know, <laughs> and you're walking around with like the most important artifact to this cult, sure. uh, you know, ever <laughs> until you go to the right college. And they're like, where did you get that? Right. Where if you notice people mostly? disappearing around you, like, <laughs> When I yeah. started the semester, the class had 30 people in it. Now there's only 20. Right, and they're all like... gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, like, you could take this to any level, right? And I think that's what's fun about it is that you get to say, like, these these objects that my character has, this place they're from, this, you know, the the, the people that they knew before they started adventuring, like, they're all a part of this world, and therefore they are a source for potential adventure and complications and, and all kinds of things. So uh, it, it's worth it. It's worth sitting down and hashing those details out. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Uh, because they're going to need that equipment to fight monsters. Yeah. And if we can tell anything about monsters is they have their own story to tell. Like certainly the monsters, yeah. the monsters of your world. I mean, to me, they're just as important as the books. Like you can learn just as much, uh, uh, just by, you know, interacting, uh, with them or you should be able to, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, all, all the monsters come with those sort of like baked in lore, right? And sometimes it's, it's, it's fairly, you know, light. It doesn't take a lot of work to incorporate that monster into a setting like ogres would be a, a good example of this. It's like, it's a giant person eating person, you know, like there you go. It's brutish. Um, whereas others obviously have like implications for, uh, for the world and, 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 you know, what it means, like elementals are kind of like that. If they're elementals and where do they come from? How are they made? Uh, hags would be another, like, well, this, this says they eat children. So is that, uh, is that really what's happening every time there's a hag? And like, I like that about D and D monsters. I like that a lot of them are, are a consequence of some sort of tragedy or, or violence or something or accident or whatever. I like that, that they are clearly proof that you live in a supernatural, fantastical world and, and, you, you know, are just a, a fact of life. What I think D and D suffers from is just, there's too many of them to, to reliably world build around. And mm -hmm. the first step that I have in, in almost any game where I'm creating something new and I want to embed the lore of the world in things the party's going to interact with, 
is like just winnow down the list until I have a manageable 20 or so that I love. Like these are my favorite monsters for this setting, for this campaign, and then start filling in the details of the lore with specifics from the campaign and just really tying them together. And usually in the process of that, they get reskinned too, so that they look different, they behave differently. And, you know, if, if, you know, to take a generic monster like a cockatrice or something like that, you know, the one in the monster manual looks like a rooster, dinosaur, dragon thing. You know, it's kind of cool, I guess. Like, I'd be scared if I saw one in real life, but it also kind of looks just like an animal. And so I want to either play around with the image of that and, you know, my cockatrice are, are more like peacocks or birds of paradise and are just these beautiful, like dazzlingly gorgeous uh, birds with this colorful plumage or whatever. But like the sound of their of their chirps of their voice will turn you to some sort of, you know, some sort of stone right or, or crystal sometimes you know um it, it could be that that they're there as like these beautiful baroque guard animals that nobles keep on their estates to deter you know thieves of the like or it could be that they're hideous snake chicken things that are born when there's an ill omen in the sky and like a rash of cockatrice uh in a village uh which can get out of hand is indicator of perhaps a, a you know, someone working nefarious magic nearby or or mm -hmm. some grim portent that has yet to be revealed um, and, and is therefore like, you know, summon a bunch of witch finders and mage hunters to see <laughs> if anybody's doing some bad magic. Like, th those are the things that I like. It's not changing anything about the stats on those. It's all about presentation and its place in the world and like as a DM, because I don't have to wait for the player's permission. You know, there's something about the classes and the backgrounds. Not every player is going to be into it, but like I can do whatever yeah. I want with my monsters. You know, my goblins can come from snotty, greasy ooze pits deep in the bowels of hell and are, you know, then summoned forth by foul necromancy to, to work, you know, mischievous evil where they can just be a people that are as, you know, as much a civilization as elves and humans and yeah, you know, like you can mm -hmm. do so many different things with uh with your monsters to reinforce uh, the world's lore yeah i like goblins as uh as uh that's what hags make out of the babies they steal which is they, another they, they thing create right? a changeling to go in there that could they could work with later once it gets rejected right so they're creating an agent there and they're taking the children and making goblins out of them and once they make goblins, they make they 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 breed much faster. So it's just kind of a way to kickstart your own little miniature army. Uh, right, but, right, know, yeah. But but, you know, that, but that's the thing is, it can be whatever you want because again, you're the dungeon master here. Like, right. Make those tweaks and changes as you see fit. Um, yeah, and it's uh, because good way to, like freshen up old uh, monsters. Exactly. Like people right. love monsters, but people get tired of monsters. Like even the right. monsters they love. So. You know, a new coat of paint or just a slightly different description. But then halfway through the fight, they realize, wait, were we fighting a cockatrice this whole time? You're like, yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Then I, anytime you've done that to me, Jim, I love it. Like, I'm like, holy crap. Like you made yeah. the old new again. And that's yeah. the thing is that's, you know, it's kind of human nature. We, yeah, you remake it. You know, people, people get tired of remakes, but <laughs> how many times have people done Romeo and Juliet over the years? get used to it um so it's all in how you frame it so so framing your monsters as a dm though yeah. is your is that's your encounter tables so yeah. you've got your lore baked into your monsters but like how you present those monsters in a given area and how often they come up and the ways that they come up mm -hmm. is that next little step to kind of like gear the right amount of lore depending on where the the party uh, lands up ends up right when you start considering that your encounter tables that you build for any sort of region or location are like a reflection of the inhabitants of the place, like there's there's like some practical advice about building encounter tables that's make it adventure forward, no boring entries, that kind of thing. That still applies, right? But you can include like non-combat, uh, role play only uh, entries on there. 
uh, you know, there, there might be a conflict, uh, but it's just not a, yeah. a violent, combative conflict. Um, and, and, and realizing that, like, this is your chance to, like, put in front of the players parts of the, the, the lore of your world, the history, the, the specificity of it, right? And have them interact with them on, you know, like a, a firsthand basis. And like everything from the frequency, how often you check for random encounters, uh, the numbers that you roll, how many show up, you know, of, of any given uh, entry, what type of entry it is, whether they're hostile or not, like all of that says something about a place. And I think it's one thing to just like take some default numbers or you know if you're reading a guide or something online and just like going with what that says but you can make it really specific and you can like show how this world is different show how your world like exists by the way you present mm -hmm. this procedurally generated content to your party and like just being thoughtful of it and going like oh well you know no you know, no, no, uh, um, you know, Modrons ever show up in odd numbered groups, you know, just something like that. They, and they could be anything from just like little, honestly, they could be little, everything from little like treats for yourself. Like, oh, oh, I know the secret of that to little Easter eggs that if you have players who pay attention to that kind of thing or notice these little details can like pick out and go, wait a minute, like we always encounter this enemy under these circumstances and in this way like maybe there's a reason for that uh and and maybe you could make something out of that uh, revelation uh, on the player's mm -hmm. part um but yeah it's one of my favorite parts of creating a world is is this step in the process yeah it was one of my favorite things in my breath of the fall campaign since i that entire campaign was wrought from random encounter tables yeah yeah so whenever in the first episode emma's character decides to have like one of these flying little like flying squirrel like rats that are basically like flying squirrels because you got to have rodents around yeah. sure and and she wants her character to have one as a pet and i'm like i mean you realize this is like you're like a new york city cop who has a rat as a pet like that's literally the equivalent of what you're making right now and she's, and she's like yeah that's what i want that's what you and, want, yeah. um, and then eventually they get down lower in the pit or whatever, and they start seeing these giant things that are all puffed up, like these puffball things that can float around. And they make a connection eventually, like, wait a minute, those things evolve, like those little rat, tiny rat things evolve in these giant puffballs that you can ride around like an inflatable thing. And then later on, they <laughs> discovered another beast that that is the final, that's the final form Nice. because it's just one go. of those things where I was like, well, why, why wouldn't they be just the evolution yeah. of the thing? Because there's yeah. all these mutagenic resources around as they're chewing through things, it's changing their chemistry. And yeah. so I just wanted to have a kind of a, a connected like ecosystem like that in that, no, they used to be rats. The further down you go, they change because they've been exposed to this crap longer but through that, they discovered it, and that was all random tables. Uh, and yeah, they yeah. were able to discover that little bit of lore, and it was only really because one of the characters decided, I want this thing with me. So they had right. the original version of it, and then they got to see its different evolutionary processes. Um, but yeah, like yeah. you said, sometimes it's just a little nugget for you, and then you get to share it with your players, and then they, yeah. get, they get to be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and sometimes it's just something new they know about a place about the world like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to have huge ramifications or or be like earth shattering or lead to years of adventure it could just be i know this now like and the more of those little things they know the more they can reference it and pick them out themselves and like the greater the attachment to a place and um and, and you know i think it's really fun when you can get a player interested in something you create that you know, you realize, then realizing like, well, you're both kind of creating it together in those moments, just from these little nuggets mm -hmm. of these little prompts of just like, yeah. oh, yeah, OK. And the fact that they're embedded in what your characters are, are about and what the players are interacting with just makes it more likely it'll come up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, well, that's how it goes. <laughs> uh, well, if uh, you out there would like to, to create this little encounter together, if you click the like and subscribe button and then the bell you'll get a notification whenever a new video comes up. So you can kind of complete the whole lore dump process in that little interaction itself. Also, check out uh, comments and description there uh, for our mailing list because we've got a Kickstarter coming up. We want to give you all the, informo in, uh, the information that we can. 
So why don't you just go ahead and click that and uh, you'll get that info. Have a good one. Yeah, so we're ironically we're gonna shit or get off the pot here by talking about world building without the lore dump. Or something like that. And we're just I mean, saying, you call yeah, it we're, stop we're lore dumping. Off, we're getting off the pot. <laughs> we're getting off the pot and we're gonna world build without the lore dump here on WebDM. Gonna hold it in. <laughs> we're gonna... So just hold on, hold it in like for a, a second as we get off the it in. <laughs> we're going to hold it in while uh, you need to hold it in there while we get off the pot and talk about world building without the lore dump here on WebDM. Eh?